Good morning, everyone. Dan, can you hear me? Excellent. Yes. Still on the uh, habits that it's in person again. Madam Chair, it looks like we have a uh, quorum, so whenever you're ready to start the meeting, um, please feel free. All right. Uh, we'd like to welcome everybody to the June 22nd, 2022 Landmarks Commission meeting. <clears throat> In compliance with notification requirements of Ohio's open meeting law in section 101.021 of the codified ordinances of Cleveland, Ohio, 1976, Notice that this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the city planning department conducts its meetings according to Robert's rules of order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by roll call vote. Recusal from any case due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to the beginning of the presentation. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting has the opportunity to be heard, virtual attendants will be uh, use the raised hand feature before asking a question or making a comment. The raised hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and mobile version and activated by clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking the raised hand icon again and muting your microphone. Call in users can unmute by using star six. All meeting activities are being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being uh, live streamed via YouTube. All requests to speak on a particular matter submitted through proper channels have been considered. Proper channels for comments are sending an email to landmarks at clevelandohio.gov email address with a comment or a letter, calling or leaving a message at 216-664-2532, sending a letter or dropping off comments in uh, City Hall, 601 uh, Lakeside Avenue, Suite 519. Finally, communication with members of this body must follow proper channels uh, for consideration. Any comments received by the stated deadline uh, are collected by landmark staff and disseminated to the commission members prior to any scheduled meeting. Oh, yeah. Madam Chair, I'll go through the uh, meeting rules and procedures for the Cleveland Landmarks Commission. Um, the chair will do that. If, uh, can everyone uh, who is joining virtually, could you please mute your microphones? Yeah. 
What have you got there? Go ahead, Mr. Musson. All right. Um, uh, the chair will call each agenda item and then each applicant will be invited to proceed through well, their presentation. Right each now. presentation should be completed prior to questions and comments from the commission and in order to facilitate a smooth presentation. Once the presentation is concluded, the chair will ask landmark staff to summarize design review committee recommendations and any public comments received. The deadline for public comments is noon on the Tuesday prior to any regularly scheduled Cleveland Landmarks Commission meeting. Any received comments are distributed to commission members prior to the meeting. Staff will also identify any members of the public present and scheduled to speak. Public comment is allowed at the discretion of the chair and any individual providing public comment is permitted two minutes to speak to an agenda item in which they have an interest. The chair will then request recommendation from staff. The commission will then begin deliberations and project review. Any commission member except the chair may make a motion at any point after an agenda item has been called. We will then um, um, begin our um, with our certificates of appropriateness. We'll begin with the first applicant. We invite uh, them Madam, to unmute your, oh, go ahead. Uh, we need to call the meeting to order and do a roll oh, call. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, we'd like to call the meeting to order. Mr. Mustin, please call roll. All right, thank you. Ms. Anderson? Here. Mr. Benezzi? Here. Mr. Uh, Mr. Dreyer? Here. Mr. Edmond? Here. Council Member Gray? Director Wong? Mr. Strickland? Here. Mr. Trosick? Here. And Ms. Trot? Here. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me on task, Mr. Wilson. We'll then begin with our certificates of appropriateness. Um, we'd like to invite our first applicant forward to unmute your mic, announce yourself, and tell us about your project. First applicant is Seabright Terrace, located at 533-553 East 114th Street. Proposed demolition. Hi, Brett Parsons with the City of Cleveland. Um, as I said, we have a proposed demolition of these row houses on East 114th Street. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide, here's the site location and context. As you can see, it's on 114th, sort of near the St. Clair Ave. Um, if you can advance again. So some comments. Um, this is, we had our asbestos surveyor go out and they were unable to access some of the units because they are so structurally unsound. The roof in some units has collapsed all the way into the basement. And this also is a incredibly high priority for the councilman. As you can see on this top right photo, he speaks a lot with the neighbor who lives right next door in this house on the bottom right. And part of the row houses have fallen into her yard before. And as he says, you know, there are young kids that live in that yard. So this really is a safety hazard for the neighbors and a high priority for the councilman. If we could advance to the next slide, here are some photos of the property of both the front and the back. We can advance again. Can we go to the next slide? Some, some more photos. As you can see in that top left photo, there really is no roof on some of the last units. You can look in through that window and just look totally up to the sky. It's the units are totally open to the elements. If you can advance again. I'll go through the specific units. So 533 is in state forfeiture. It's been vacant since 2021. We've received seven complaints and had to board up this structure twice. You can advance to the next slide. Here are some interior photos of that unit. We can advance again. 535 is owned by an LLC. And this structure has also been vacant since at least 2021. We've received five complaints and boarded up this structure twice. We can advance interior photos. You can advance again. 537 is in state forfeiture. It's been vacant since at least 2016. We've received four complaints and boarded up the property four times. Advance again. Some interior photos and advance again. Uh, 539 is also in forfeiture. It's been vacant since at least 2013. The city has received five complaints. You can look, this really showcases how structurally unsound some of these units are. Again, 541, it's owned privately by Thomas Brown Jr. Been vacant since 2018. We've received three complaints and boarded it up four times. 
Um, this one was totally inaccessible. Our surveyor could not take a single photo of this unit. Um, we'll leave it again. Five, four, three in forfeiture, vacant since 2016. We've received one complaint and boarded up the structure twice. Good look at advance, interior photos, advance again. Five, four, five, also owned by Thomas Brown Jr., been vacant since at least 2016. We've received one complaint and boarded the structure up six times. Advance. Um, this one really showcases how the roof did collapse all the way into the basement. That is a door, presumably from the second floor, that has made its way um, through the ceiling. So we can advance again, five, four, seven in forfeiture, vacant since 2013. We've received one complaint and boarded up the structure five times. Advance again, interior photos, we can advance again. Five, four, nine, also in forfeiture, vacant since 2015. We've had received five complaints and boarded it up five times. Again, you can also see how totally open to the elements and pretty structurally unsound this unit is. 551 in forfeiture, vacant since 2013. We've received seven complaints and boarded it up six times. Advance again. Again, you can see it's in pretty rough shape. Advance again. 553 in forfeiture, vacant since 2015. We've received seven complaints and boarded the structure up six times. There are some interior photos. Then if we could advance again. So for the site plan, our site plan would be to demolish the structure. And then I know the local design review um, suggested that we plant trees on these lots. However, I talked with my team and that is actually not within our purview. We do not have the authority to do that because this is nuisance abatement. Our only job and our only ability to move forward is to demolish the structure and to have the site plan be a vacant lot. Um, that's all we are able to do at the moment. Um, yeah, so thank you. Happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. We'll begin with feedback from the local design uh, review committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. This project was reviewed on uh, the 20th by the Northeast Design Review District. They recommended approval with, um, as noted, a recommendation to save as many trees as possible and also a preference for planting more trees on the site until uh, future site development. All right, and Madam, hey. Madam Chair, before we get into the staff opinion, it appears we have uh, Council Member uh, Anthony Harrison from Ward 10 here, if he'd like to speak. Excellent, welcome Councilman. Please go ahead. Good morning, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for having me. Uh, well, one, I, this is, a very exciting day to be at this point here before the Landmarks Commission. You know, these properties, have, as you heard, have been vacant for quite some time. In fact, they've been vacant much longer than what the uh, slide shows. Uh, I believe that's when folks began to really uh, issue complaints or, or send in complaints about the property's condition. Uh, I did get a chance to meet the um, uh, commission out at the site uh, a couple of weeks ago. To look at the conditions and you know, I, I'm I'm shocked that they were they actually went into the property because of the conditions that they are in. Very, very unsafe. Uh you you really can see standing on the sidewalk through many of the units uh that fronts the uh, sidewalk there. I mean, you literally can see the sky uh standing from the sidewalk through many of these properties. So uh I really don't have too much to add. The pictures speak for themselves. Uh, it is very much a nuisance, a safety concern for those who live on East 114th Street. If you, when you come out of East 114th Street, Glenville High School is right at the corner, right at the corner. You have many neighboring uh, residential uh, stores, uh, a, a, a art gallery at the corner of the street. So uh, understand why this is, is truly a priority of ours. Uh, as uh, Brett indicated, the neighbor next door, has been an advocate for seeing these properties uh, demolished for quite some time. She has young kids, she has a home daycare, and part of the building did fall over into her yard. Thank the Lord we had a building and housing department who was very responsive, who was able to go out and assist with removing some debris uh, from the front uh, uh, part of her uh, her yard. She took care of some of the rest, you know, but that really could have been uh, something tragic uh, for the young people who play in the yard next door to uh, these row houses. I, I, I don't agree that the trees should be planted here on this side. I think it should be, remain an open area where uh, young people can use as a play area for now until uh, uh, such development is uh, determined for the site. 
In fact, you know, I can probably work with uh, a local organization to maybe program the, uh, the the green space, maybe do some planter boxes and some other things on the site and, and working with um, a public work. So, again, you know, I, I'll be quiet there. The pictures are self-explanatory, uh, very much in need of repair, well, not repair, of, of demolition, and they've been a safety concern for quite some time in the neighborhood, including myself, is very excited to see this process happening and for them to be demolished. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, landmark staff review. Thank you, Madam Chair. Site visit was conducted on June 12th, 2023. To note, site Seabright Terrace was designated as a Cleveland landmark on June 4th, 2007. It was constructed as a 14 unit, two story brick terrace. It had the complex two residential units share a front porch. The building fronts 200 feet along East 114th Street. Before it was, 1906, it was known as Seabright Street. Yellow brick building is topped with a stone parapet and the name Seabright Terrace 1906. The rest of the street is lined with two-story framed houses. Seabright Terrace is significant because of its architecture and is an example of terrace construction. Many terraces were built in the early 20th century on Cleveland's east and west side to house working and middle class residents. This was one of the finer examples of terrace construction on Cleveland's east side. It's located just off of St. Clair Avenue, which was a major streetcar transportation line from Glenville to downtown Cleveland and within walking distance of the St. Clair East 105th Street Retail Center. The terrace was built by real estate developer Albert E. Dudley and designed by architect Nicola Petty, who is the architect of several houses and apartment buildings on the east side and several local theaters, including the Variety Theater and the Cedar Lee Theater. Our photos from the site visit. The property is an extreme deteriorated state. There is a lot of dumping going on here. There's additional fencing. There was a secondary structure. There were a lot of alcohol bottles, at least one needle on the ground. There are a lot of decorative elements still intact. It was designated in 2007 after three of the units were demolished. And at that time, they felt that the rest of it needed to be saved, so it could be. But we are disappointed of how this turned out. This building was in rough shape at the time of its designation, and there should have been an immediate stabilization plan and action taken. The intent to save this building was great, but just designating these buildings and having the desire to save them does nothing. We need plans. We need action. If we are to, if city council wants to designate a building that's in a deteriorated state, we need to have an immediate plan within six months. And we need to work with the local CDCs and have something go on. This photo here is from the time it was designated. We believe that these elements still exist and might be on the roof. It, it's tough to keep seeing demolitions come to us. And this is not going to be the last one proposed. This is not sustainable. Recommendation of staff is to approve the demolition of the terraces, the fencing and the secondary structure site clearance of all garbage, 
all trees in front of the existing building will probably be compromised at their root systems and are probably causing damage anyway, which will also help clear for future development. Select trees and other vegetation in the rear yard should also be cleared and to work with urban forestry department on which ones to keep and which ones to remove. We need a salvage plan for bricks, stone, and decorative elements. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brunches. We'll open up the floor to the commission for questions and comments. Mr. Strickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, it's a shame to see such a uh, beautiful structure fall into such disrepair, especially when uh, efforts were taken in 2007 to try to uh, designate it so that some proactive uh, response could have been formulated, but uh, probably with the multiple ownership of the individual units. Uh, I'm sure it was very difficult, virtually impossible to uh, <clears throat> coordinate resources effectively amongst those multiple owners to uh, come up with a salvage plan. Uh, in terms of the recommendation from staff to salvage various items, so my question for the city demolition department is, do you have the uh, resources and the means and the uh, ability to store salvage items? Um, honestly, I don't know. I would assume that, you know, we could work with our contractors and sort of request that they salvage certain aspects. But I would assume that once the contractors gather them all, that we would hand them off to landmarks. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe, maybe Carl can pop in there. <laughs> I know the councilman had uh, mentioned on site a desire to save some of the elements. Perhaps I'll, I'll defer to him for some answers as to what can be reused in the future. Uh, thank you. So, you know, after going back to the site uh, with um, some. Um, individuals it, we we thought that maybe the 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 yellow brick probably wasn't really a um you know that we really need to save the yellow brick but more of the larger sandstone blocks uh Carl that we looked at on site mm -hmm. those larger that's up underneath the window seals yep um maybe if those can be saved if the yellow bricks can be saved but i'm not sure where you know we can store those large um uh, blocks that that sits up under the uh, window sills. Other than that, I think the rest of it uh, can go. I don't see anything else that maybe we should be preserved except for those uh, larger uh, kind of uh, sandstone um, blocks. Yeah, understood. It it certainly is. Um, it would be highly beneficial to be able to save some of those significant stone items. But uh, again, a plan needs to be formulated and resources dedicated to uh, identifying where they could be stored until they could be uh, reused effectively either on this site or other sites around the city. So that would be another initiative I think that would be worth undertaking to uh, come up with a system, especially when the demolition is being uh, done and coordinated through the city to come up with a uh, some kind of a repository to uh, store these salvage items because as Carl said this is not this unfortunately type of project will continue so we need a uh, a system and the resources to be able to store some of these critical items thank you Thank you, Mr. Strickland. Mr. Edmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. I agree with the comments already made, um, particularly Carl's comments. And this is a really just a question for, I think, for Carl. Um, you know, the, this uh, terrace typology we see a lot in Cleveland and the entering suburbs, and it seems to be sort of unique to our area, or at least particular to our area. Do you know if, if there's a if they've been cataloged, we know where they are. I mean, I always see them kind of in unexpected places. Um, do we know if if there's any repository of of 
all of the uh, remaining terrace buildings? I believe two are designated Cleveland landmarks on the west side, Neal Terrace and Ottman Terrace. I don't know how many, there's some smaller examples. We did have uh, Stephens Terrace that is delayed in designation and we need to really follow up on that one on the east side in Ward 9. Uh, I think maybe we can look at, I know we just had a citywide survey done. Maybe we can look at that and see, draw any information from that, uh, see where else they exist. But we just lost one uh, on Cedar. Really beautiful example that was allowed to decay as well. Uh, Cedar and um, Stokes. And we keep losing them. And actually, this is the type of construction we probably need to see more of. And mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be brick. If we're looking for different typologies of buildings, single family homes, or these terraces would be great for their intended purpose for working class people. So maybe we should start looking at adding more of these throughout the city again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. <clears throat> um, I, oh, Mrs. Anderson, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was at the site this visit and in, it is indeed in very, very poor condition. Um, so, you know, I, I agree with the demolition. Uh, I agree with Carl, of course, that it's a tragedy that something like this has to come down. Uh, these are, you know, I've, I've sold these buildings in the past, and this is a really popular floor plan. People like these kind of um, terrace style units. Uh, it's it's a shame that we're we're losing this. It's um, you know, I, I I read somewhere I I can't remember where I read it, and I can't remember the exact quote, but they're saying, you know, the the greenest building is is the building that already exists. So, uh, you know, if, if we can somehow intercede that that would be environmentally uh, beneficial instead of putting everything in a in a landfill and, and starting over again. Uh, so those are my comments. Reluctantly, I, it's a shame that this is has to come down, but it, it probably does. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Um, I reluctantly, uh, with a heavy heart, agree with everything that's been said. This is a um could have been continued to be it could have continued to be a great and um asset within the city and it's a shame that they've been left to deteriorate like they have but agree with the recommendation of demolition <clears throat> um with that being said would someone like to make a motion mr strickland Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I would uh, move to approve the demolition as presented for the all of these structures uh, with the following the recommendation of design review that and the staff that we uh, salvage any significant stone elements um, as might be possible. Take the motion. Um, do you have a second, Mr. Trosik? Yes, I'll second. All right, thank you. Um, any further discussion? Mr. Musson, please call roll then. All right, Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Benezzi? Yes. Mr. Dreyer? Yes. Mr. Edmund? Yes. Mr. Strickland? Yes. Mr. Trasic? Yes. And Ms. Trot? Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes unanimously. All right. Thank you. Thanks for your um, time, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to our next applicant, the Manthe residence located at 3820 West 33rd Street, siding replacement. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Scott Hedrick with Empire Windows. And, Good morning. Uh, Go right ahead. Um, I'm here to uh, 
see about doing siding on this residence. The color's close to uh, what color is there now. The house is uh, made of wood and um, they would like to put siding on the house and the garage in an Oxford blue, stay consistent with uh, the historic value of the house and do scallops at the top where it's circled in the front gable. Um, trim the windows so that uh, they can preserve the house and not have to worry about any more rotted wood or anything of that sort. The style of the siding is called clapboard, and that's the that's primarily what's on the house now in wood is clapboard. So it's not a siding look like the one on the right there, the previous picture. Um, I'm assuming that concludes your presentation. I wouldn't know what more to say. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we will continue moving forward. Um, let's review design review committee recommendations. This was seen by the Tremont Brooklyn Center Design Review Committee on June 6, 2023. There was no quorum available. After some, a bit of discussion and, um, we noted that this was not about the quality of work that is done by this company. It's about the appropriateness of the materials being proposed. Recommendation for denial as presented by the members present. Thank you. Moving on to landmark staff review. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, staff agrees with local, um, the, the local design review committee. Um, this this property is the same one that we saw um, I guess a couple months back that uh, there's the the issue of the fence being installed without a permit so we're still still hoping to work with the owners on that but we have not heard from them um, I'm trying to find solutions for that as far as the siding goes um, we feel that it's it's inappropriate given that it appears that all of the original siding and trim are intact so um, staff would recommend disapproval well there is no siding on the house now referring to the original wooden siding the the true clapboards that are on the house currently okay thank you for um that summary of recommendations we'll now open up the floor to the commission for questions and comments who would like to start us off i would um, we are uh, talking about the, uh, I'm sorry, right now it's the time for the commission to ask you questions. So one moment, sir, I'm sure we'll have a few questions for you. All right. All right, then up, oh, Mr. Strickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just looking at this picture, <clears throat> it looks like the ex existing siding is in very good condition. And, uh, you know, houses of this, nature historic nature uh have to be maintained and they have to be painted on uh regular intervals but uh the condition 
<clears throat> of the existing siding is and trim appears to be excellent. And um, so I would not be in favor of applying vinyl siding on this structure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strickland. I would tend to agree with your um, response there. I'd just like to ask the applicant, um, what is the reasoning of the ownership of replacing it? It does look like it's in good shape. It doesn't look like it's peeling or dilapidated. Um, what's their reasoning for covering up the wood siding with vinyl? Well, no disrespect, but uh, I'm sure several of you guys probably do have siding on your houses. Uh, it's the obvious to preserve the existing structure. The structure is very old. If you look up close, there's many areas of the house that are, you know, chipped away, rotted, uh, have been repaired. Um, you know, if if in today's today's world, if you had uh, uh, people sanding down, replacing pieces of wood, and everything, it's it's it would cost as much as siding the whole house. Uh, um, by siding the house. You're not only going to, uh, uh, we put what's called a moisture barrier insulation on the house first, that's gonna save the people 14% more off their utility bills. We all know what's going on with energy costs these days. Paint's not gonna save them anything off their utility bills. Uh, in addition to that, the vinyl siding's gonna last, it's a lifetime, it's guaranteed as long as they own the, their home. They'll never have to paint again, whereas, with this, uh, you know, you're, you're painting every two to three years uh, with a structure this old, with wood this old. Um, that's extremely expensive, especially a house this size. Um, um, there's, you know, uh, the, the pictures aren't there, but one of the members of the last board said they drove by and uh, and I asked them if they looked at the houses next door, if they looked at the house across the street that's fallen apart. Um, you know, the house one door, uh, two doors down is like this bright, bright blue color that's, you know, just doesn't fit anywhere, anywhere. These people are doing a nice color that's similar to the color of what they have. They're adding scallops to the front of the house to make it look more Victorian. Um, they're, they're doing home improvements that are costing them a lot of money. But in addition to that, they're preserving the structure. They're not changing, they're not adding uh, you know, in addition to change the look of the house or configuration of the house or anything of that sort. It just, it's, I've been doing this for 29 years for the company, for my company that I work for. Uh, it's it's mind boggling to me that uh, uh, for somebody that wants to improve their property, that the board wouldn't see that. Uh, especially if you go in the neighborhood and you see, like the, the the person before me this morning, you see dilapidated uh, buildings and, and, and structures and stuff like that. Um, these people want to improve their property. And uh, we appreciate that they want to improve their property. And I think that's where you know, we, uh, they're, they're, intends to really uh, continue to invest is admirable and we really commend them for that. We just want the improvements to be in alignment with the requirements for this house in this district. So although their neighbors might have a different approach, their neighbors are, we have to look at it one uh, by one. And this building is beautiful and they've done a wonderful job maintaining it. And we want to make sure that it's uh, maintained and uh, it, it maintains its full, in all of its characteristics moving forward. And one of that is the lap siding. Um, has the ownership approached landmark staff and spoken to them about the options and opportunities that they have related to this house or the Cleveland Restoration Society? That I can't speak on, but the only other option is paint. There's no other options. 
uh, and they have painted it uh, several, you know, several, I know at least twice, but I don't know any more than that. And, um, you know, it's, it's costly to paint. And if you keep adding it up over and over and over and over again, it, it just is pretty much a waste of money. Um, so unless you guys can give me a, another idea as to what they could do to preserve it. Um, of course, if we could go back to lead paint, that would preserve it. Um, but uh, we can't do that. So. And there are other paint um, products out there that are lasting you know, 10, 20 years. Uh, so I think there are options, opportunities related to paints that it, uh, would far exceed the two year you know, recommend, um, statement. Um, but with that being said, I'm sorry, Mr. Musson, go ahead. I think I interrupted you. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, I just wanted to add in, I, Landmark staff hasn't been reached out to by the uh, by the homeowner to, to talk about other solutions. Um, not sure if they've talked to CRS either. The city does have a paint program that assists with the cost of paint. Um, you know, as, as an assistance, I don't I don't think they'll do the painting for you, but that, that could help financially. As does a Cleveland Restoration Society typically have low uh, loans, uh, low rated lo loans to help um, offset the cost of maintaining you know, uh, uh, historic houses. So right now, I mean, I appreciate, as I said, that this owner wants to maintain it and you know, that they have taken such care to this house to date. And we want to continue that. But right now, I cannot support the vinyl siding replacement in its full extent. Feedback from uh, other commission members. Uh, Madam Chair, I have my hand up, but maybe it's not showing up on your end. Oh, it's not showing up on my hand on my end, but go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, in the past, the commission has allowed uh, applicants to install siding on uh, the back of the property or on sites which are not visible from the street. Uh, of course, the garage that would that would be allowed. Um, and uh, you know, contacting CRS, they they do provide the low interest loans, and they also could provide expertise to guide. Um, homeowners and property owners on how to uh, best, you know, maintain the exterior in a historically correct manner. So I, I would recommend that they reach out to CRS. Uh, and again, uh, you know, part of the house could be cited, which uh, would, you know, impact the uh, future maintenance. Those are my comments. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Other commissions, questions, or comments? Would the board be open to that? Um, in the past, we have. I think we would want to see what your proposal would be. Typically, we would not allow vinyl on the front elevations, and it would you know, require some work with staff to determine where, since this elevation has a um, Two different planes in to it, which and where you start and stop in the vinyl would need to be a conversation. But I think I would be open to that personally on um, with coordination with the landmark staff. Because uh, if you go back a couple pictures, it's it's really just the front where the shake or the uh, uh, right there. Uh, Right there. That's that's the front of the house. That's the only that's what faces the street. The sides and the garage uh, you can't see from the street. Or the back, of course, because there's houses back there. Um Mr. Mawson, did you have feedback? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um this this house is fairly visible from, I guess, at least three sides, uh, you know, staff would be supportive of siding the garage. Um, you know, there, there probably are some elements on the rear of the house there, you know, maybe behind the bump out. Um, but given that this is a double lot, uh, it's, it's, it's very visible from the street from, you know, it's not just that front facade that's so visible. 
with the applicant on an option here is I think there, there could be a compromise as we're saying, um, but it would take some coordination with landmark staff to determine the right locations. Does would the applicant uh, support tabling this project to allow you to talk to ownership and or to landmark staff to coordinate a revised plan to um, move this project forward? Are you asking me? Yes, Mr. Oh. Hedrick, sorry. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to the uh, residents. Yes, of course. Okay, well, then um, with that support, uh, I would recommend that we table this to allow you the time to talk to you know, the owners. Okay. All right, so um, if other commission members agree with that, can we have a motion? Yes, I'll, I'll move to table this, uh, this project uh, to allow uh, them to uh, confer with staff. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Do we have I'll a second? second? I'll second that motion. Thank you, Mr. Strickland. With a second, any further discussion? All right. When when would the next meeting be? Do you know? Our next meeting is in two weeks. Oh. Oh, wow. It's oh. a lot quicker than I thought. Actually, um, we'll Madam Chair, this. next. Yeah, it's three weeks. We have a, a a five Thursday month in June. So. Sorry about that. So three weeks, um, and we'll uh, ask you to coordinate with staff to make sure there's room on that agenda. But if there's room, you could reappear as soon as in three weeks. Okay, good. Thank okay. you. Of course. Any further discussion? All right, Mr. Musson, please call roll and announce the results. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Yes. Mr. Benezzi. Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Yes. Mr. Edmund. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Trasic. Yes. And Ms. Trot. Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes unanimously. All right. So, Mr. Hedrick, we look forward to you know, uh, we'd ask you to reach, talk to the owner and then reach out to Landmark staff to coordinate the extents of where um, we would recommend collectively to start and stop the siding versus ma either maintaining the, the wood collapse on in the existing wood clap siding. Okay. In okay. Details. And in the meantime, I'll get I'll get uh, more pictures, maybe up close and also from different angles from the street and stuff. So that would be great. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye bye. Bye. And what do I do? We'll move on to the third applicant, the Cox residence, located one zero seven zero five Drexel Avenue, window replacement. Hi, how's it? How's it going? Good, thank you. Um, yeah, so they are looking at getting their windows taken care of. Um, I was not the um, <clears throat> person on the call last time, so I'm not a hundred percent sure what you guys have discussed. Um, but. What questions do you guys a quick overview of what you're proposing? And then yeah. we will go to on um, this. We will then review our questions afterwards. So that I want you to just give us a quick overview of the entire uh, scope. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Musson has some feedback. Go ahead, Mr. Musson before you start. Um, just as before the presentation starts, if the applicant could just introduce himself with name and company. Yeah, uh, Zach Tame with the Home Depot installation services. Thank so, you. Go ahead. Yeah, with with this project, we're planning to replace the windows uh, on the majority of the first floor and the two main bedrooms on the second floor. Um, they were having a lot of rotting issues with quite a few of the sills. They are having issues with the majority of the sashes also having rot and separation. Um, so the plan is to replace them with a high quality vinyl window. Uh, from my notes, it looks like, um, or what I saw was that you guys would like to switch to the cottage or Oreo style, the 40, 60 split, like it currently has, which the customer is completely okay with. Um, we did talk to them about restoration. They said they did look into it. Um, it costs about the same as replacing their windows, um, if not more. And a lot of them, they 
we're told it probably wouldn't be able to be salvaged anyway. Um, at least some in the back dining room area there that you saw. Um, uh, that last, or uh, two pictures ago, I believe. Um, they're not there, but the one before, those ones, yeah. Uh, because of some how the sashes are rotted on the inside there. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, the plan is to put a high quality vinyl window in there. Um, the property they live in, which is across currently, which is across the street, um, they were able to get vinyl sit or vinyl windows approved through the city a few years back. But uh, that is where we're at. All right, thank you for the presentation summary um, of your scope. We will wait to get through all the pictures. Thank you, Mr. Brunges. All right, then we will move on to design review committee recommendations. Um, Dick Madam Chair, this project was reviewed by the Magnolia Wade Park East Boulevard Grant Allotments Design Review Committee on the 15th. Uh, they did not have quorum, but they did discuss, um, as noted, a preference for uh, preserving the original windows and looking into options beyond vinyl for the front of the home, at least, and pertaining the configuration of the existing windows. Um, because the first floor, at least in the front and on the sides, appears to have uh, the 40-60 windows, not the typical 50-50 double hung. Um, Madam Chair, you're muted. Thank you. Um, we will move on to landmark staff review and recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, staff uh, essentially agrees with the, the local design review committee. Um, we'd recommend either you know disapproval as presented or, or tabling so that the uh, homeowner has time to, to work out another solution. Uh, we certainly feel that the cottage sash configuration should be maintained, even if there are replacement windows. Uh, we think there's a potential for restoration of the front, or at least an upgraded material. Um, again, if it was an upgraded material, it would maintain that cottage sash 60-40 split. Sure. Thank you for that review and recommendation. Um, we'll now open the floor to the Commission for questions and comments. I'll start us off. I think uh, you just uh, listened to the last recommendation. Our typical um, approach is that vinyl windows are not appropriate in historic districts. We do, similar to vinyl siding, we do make compromises to due to um, scope to try to come up with a, an approach that can you know, meet the intent of the historic districts, but also you know, move forward the desire of the owner, which we do appreciate them wanting to invest and improve their, their house. Um, I would support uh, having vinyl windows in certain areas of the rear or you know, back areas to help uh, address their, their needs for maintenance, but the front of the house and where that front line would stop and start, I think would be need to be discussed with staff and support a either restoration or replacing with a composite material for um, or wood clad, aluminum clad material for the front um, areas. But it would not be as moved per presented. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, so good question. When you say composite, is that like Anderson FiberX would work? Are we talking strictly Correct. fiberglass? Oh, so FiberX would work, okay, because that was, that was one of the customer's main concern is like financially, how do they make this happen? Still have something energy efficient. For example, the same job we quoted in wood and it came out to $39,462.53, where right now it's $13,846.50. So obviously it'd be a big jump in price to do it all in wood, something that the customer doesn't feel they're very capable of handing, but FiberX, um, we could definitely consider doing that. 
I think it would take some coordination with staff because we understand the energy programs that are out there right now and the intense, but this isn't a historic district and we need to maintain you know, our standards at minimum on the front elevation. And the visibility determines where that exact start and stop are. Um, that's my personal opinion. Mr. Musson, you have some feedback here. Then Ms. Anderson, I saw your hand up and it went down. So I'll call on you next to so Mr. Musson. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, just wanted to, I guess, make it clear. Steph, Steph doesn't um, doesn't recommend actual wood windows anywhere on homes anymore. Uh, they're, they're just they don't last anymore. So we do, you know, tend to lean towards the aluminum clad or the composite uh, fiberglass windows. Those tend to be more durable. But straight wood, you know, they they certainly cost a lot more and they. They yeah. just don't last, so staff doesn't really ever well, recommend those at this point. I, I, I was saying a for a cladded window. I mean, you're you're over two times in the, the cost of the project is what I was trying to. That was a Anderson cladded wood product would be. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. Um, let's see. All right. Thank you, Mr. Musson. Anderson, did you continue to have questions? I just wanted to mention that. The applicant can use the vinyl windows on areas of the house that are not visible from the street. We normally are, are fine with that. Um, I think we probably would want to see the 60-40 split, but I, the, the entire house does not have to be done with the aluminum clad windows. So, you know, it would just be the selected windows that are visible from the from the street. Agree. So. Okay. so Similar to, um, go ahead, Mr. I, sorry, I don't know your last name. It comes off as just Dang. Zach on my screen. <laughs> sorry. Sorry That's about okay. that. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to ask for you guys, what do you consider like visible from the street? There's some on the one part of the front of the house. You can see it curves over. Is it a whole, all of those windows in the front? Or the one that's kind of on the side, but not quite on the side. Does that one count? What I'd Just recommend for... is that, you know, I think that is a conversation that um, needs to be had, but I don't know if this is the form. Yeah. To it. I think it would probably be best if with your support uh, to table this similar to what we just did with a previous applicant and um, allow you time to sit down yourself in ownership to sit down with landmark staff. Uh, to discuss where uh, collectively we could agree the front and the mo more visible areas of the building are and where the material would just need to change. So, gotcha. but it would mean that we would uh, need your permission to table you so that we could do, um, you could have that offline conversation. And Mr. Musson, your hand is up again, so please go ahead. Um, yeah, Mr. Brunges' uh, raise hand function isn't working, so he had some comments. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Um... I will echo that, that contact us. I think one of the things that happened here, and I know I used to have a relationship with Home Depot and how to identify when you're working in a historic district so we can have these conversations ahead of time. Because I think having the proactive conversation about what would be appropriate and what is not would be very helpful in this case. Um, I forget who I used to work with over there, but I think my name was in their computer. Um, we can train, retrain staff for Home Depot how to use our GIS system so we can have this type of conversation. Um, but for us, just as a first blush, uh, we felt that the front of the building, including this in the front portion, numbers 1 and 15, should be part of that conversation as to the upgraded material. But the ones in the rear, could we would be uh, flexible on like 16, 17, and I think it's at 18. These three, I think we could be flexible just as long as you're matching the format. These up here would probably be the upgraded material. Just as a first level, but we'll contact you. I would recommend table as well, and we can talk you through that. So Zach, do we have your permission to table to allow that conversation to happen offline? Yeah, sounds good to me. Okay, thank you. So with the permission, uh, would someone from the commission like to make a motion to table? I'll move to table. So thank you, Ms. Anderson. Oh, oh go ahead. A second, this is Carter. 
All right. Thank you for that uh, motion and second. And Ms. Anderson, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you have more? I'm sorry, to just so that the uh, applicant can confer with staff. Excellent. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right, Mr. Musson, please call roll and announce the results. All right, Ms. Anderson. Yes. Mr. Benezzi. Yes. Mr. Dreyer. Yes. Mr. Edmund. Yes. Mr. Strickland. Yes. Mr. Trasic. Yes. And Ms. Trot. Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes unanimously. All right. Thank you. So, Zach, um, please reach out to staff, and we look forward to seeing you come back in the future. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. We'll then move on to our next applicant, Duracy Slice Shop, 603 Prospect Avenue East, window installation and patio construction. Good morning. How are you guys? Good, thank you. Good. Jessica with Rough Neon and Lighting. Here to present on um, behalf of Duracy's for 603 Prospect Avenue. Um, on this slide, it's just showing an overview of the building. Um, the next uh, slide, if you'd advance that, this um, refers to the window on the left hand corner there. It's a three foot by three foot window. Um, it is placed on the right of the building. And if you hit, could advance the next slide, please. And this also shows just um, the specs on the window. It's three foot by three foot, four and a quarter wide. And this represents the fencing in the front of the building. It is nine by 19 foot 11 with an eight foot opening. Um, and the next slide refers to the overall size of the fencing. It is three feet tall. Um, the fencing is black in color. And the next slide, please, thank you. This represents um, how the fencing was mounted to the concrete, four inch by four inch plates, and then four bolts, um, three and a half um, long bolts were in place, three and a uh, eighth inch bolts. And this represents the turf. The turf is a commercial turf. It is self-draining. Um, it is ADA compliant. And I did send that over as well on the certificate for that. And the next slide, please. Uh, this represents the adhesive. Um, if at any time we had to remove the turf, the adhesive um, will not be shown. It will remove easily. Um, no adhesive would be remaining on the concrete. And the next slide, please. And this represents just the current state. Um, if you go to the next slide, it represents the window being white. They actually did paint that black um, just with comments made from design review. So that was painted black where it represents white. It, all, it is all black now. In this slide also, you'll see to the left of this picture where the fire hydrant is, that fence has been removed um, over, I think it was 30 inches they had to remove that, but they did get, um, they sent all that to the, the fire department and um, everything has been reviewed and approved. So they did remove that fence. So it is 30 inch over. Um, I believe that was 30 inches. And if there's any questions. Oh, did you guys want me to represent the neon sign too right now? I could do that as well. Uh, this is the neon sign that's in the patio window there for the slice window. Um, it's currently when it's off, it is just clear glass. Um, when it's on, it is clear red. This is used um, only for when there's games um, late at night, baseball games or anything going on. They do open this window. This is for like a late night pizza slice. This isn't used um, during the day. Thank you for that um, presentation. We'll move on to design review committee's recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. The um, historic gateway and warehouse district neighborhoods or, or uh, design review committees reviewed these three projects. So we're looking at actually, you know, three motions, three approvals here. Um, one for the 
uh, revision to the approved signage, one for the installation of the slices window itself, and then the other for the construction of the patio. Um, as far as all of those issues are go, there was a lot of discussion from the local committee about, you know, vibrant versus contextual and which was most appropriate at the location. Ultimately, it was approved as presented uh, with the condition that the railing be moved off the fire access by the distance required by code, which it appears has already been done. Um, also, that the slices window be painted either the you know, red trim color or black, and it appears that it's, since that meeting, it's been painted black. Um, so staff, or I'm sorry, the local design review committee recommended approval with conditions that it appears are, are already incorporated into the building. Okay. Thank you, Landmark staff review. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to note, there will be an additional variance needed for the signage. This was reviewed by PetBot on June 6th. It will need a streetscape amenity permit application and drawing submitted to building and housing for exterior facade changes and outdoor dining. Violations will need to be addressed and the fence relocated in order to maintain the required clearances. Uh, the recent changes to the property were made to reflect conversation from the local design review committee and pet bot. This is the concept plan that we were shown when the signage came through, which did not show a pizza slice window and a different type of uh, fencing. You can see here, the fence was moved away from the standpipe and that the window has been painted black. Uh, there's been a lot going on at this location. Um, after landmark sign, we went back and forth a little bit with the blade sign because there was still a reduction that needed to be made. Um, and we signed off on the permit on May 9th. All signage was being installed by May 12th without the permit being fully issued. The signage permit was issued on June 1st, 2023. The pizza window and patio elements were installed by May 17th and the shop opened on May 19th. There has not been an application for either the window or the patio thus far, and they are using the patio without a valid temporary outdoor dining permit. The pizza window did not destroy historic materials and is reversible. The artificial turf is not appropriate and should be removed. The fencing is required for alcohol consumption, but it feels more residential than commercial in its design. Thank you. Thank you. I will now open the floor up to the commission for questions and comments. Mr. Strickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Carl, with uh, what you just reviewed, does that uh, include all of the violations that were noted that have to be cleared through PetBot, or are there additional violations? The violation was uh, that the permit, the signage was installed without a permit. I don't know if they have been cited for the installation of the rest of stuff, but I believe they may have been. I would have to check on that, but yes, all, basically they do have a valid permit for the signage now that was approved. The awnings and all that stuff, uh, the patio and the slice window have not been addressed. All right. Yeah. Then um, I would agree with your car with your comment that the uh, artificial turf should be removed. I don't think that's appropriate at all, and it's not necessary. You know, the, the concrete sidewalk is fine, it's functional, and it just, uh, the artificial turf detracts from the use and the function of the space. And I think that the, uh, the fence looks cheap. It's just a low-grade aluminum fence, and what was depicted 
in the uh, concept drawing is much more appropriate. And um, I think when they apply for a permit, it should require the replacement of that fence with a more appropriate fence. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strickland. Mr. Edman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I agree with all of those comments 100%. Um, and I don't know if we have any purview over the furniture, um, but I would, I, 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 yeah, I don't know if we do, but I would strongly suggest some more appropriate um, and more durable uh, and more professional looking furniture for the patio as well. I understand that there's a casual vibe here, but you know, there, there certainly should be something more appropriate for the context. Thank you, Mr. Anders uh, Edmund, Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I definitely agree that the um, artificial turf is, is not attractive. Uh, it really kind of downgrades the look of the uh, the whole area. The um, and I agree with Mr. Edmonds on the furniture. Uh, it it really looks kind of um, you know, just a hodgepodge, just sort of assembled and not thought through. Um, maybe this is temporary. Maybe they've ordered some, you know, consistent. The is not in our purview at this point. You know, right now, it's more the physical element. So I like I understand where you're going, but if you could keep going on your comments about the what's being installed, go ahead, Ms. Anderson. The fencing doesn't bother me as much, but the the artificial turf, um, I think, downgrades, degrades the, the overall look. That's, those are my comments. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Um, I support, you know, that's, I, I appreciate that the owner is trying to now um, align with the feedback from the committee and the commission, but I would agree uh, with my fellow commission members that the turf is, uh, not appropriate in this location. Um, I, I prefer the fencing that was presented to us uh, and versus what is installed now. I can live with it, but in my preference would be the original design versus what is here. Um, I do not have any issues with the signage. So, so knowing that these are two actually items on our agenda, I wanna make sure that we talk about both. Any further questions or comments from the commission? If I can make a comment, I'm not sure um, Jason was unable to attend this meeting, um, but I know he wanted to be here and I wasn't sure if maybe for the signage we can move on, but for, as far as the, ta the um, patio and um, the turf, we can maybe um, table it for him to be here at the next meeting, if that's possible. I know the the fencing, the reason they went with the fencing is because it matches barrio fencing. So that is, they just wanted to be consistent. So I know that's why that fencing was chosen. Um, well, we appreciate that, but we would have preferred you having that conversation with staff prior to, or coming to present it prior to installing it so that we could have had that conversation before you spent the money and time to install it. Um, you know, it's just a difference between the concept and, you know, the, what was moved forward with is no, I completely understand. And so I appreciate the proposal or request that, cause we do have both on our agenda. Um, I personally be fine with that. Mr. Musson, Mr. Brunges, do you have, do you, are you on board with that too? Um, yes. Yeah. If the commission's ready to move forward with the the slice shop window and the signage as separate motions then the you know since we have the three items here the patio could be its own separate agenda you know its own separate motion and could be tabled to allow um you know the the business owner to return I, I think we would need to have a general idea if the commission supports the slice window because if the slice window is not approvable then the signage, additional signage kind of becomes moot. So can we get a general, maybe conceptual feedback from the commission on the slice window? This is Bob Strickland. I don't have a problem with the slice window or the signage at the window. 
I would agree with that based on your comments also, Mr. Brunges, that the slice window is um, reversible in the future you know, without damaging the historic context. Mr. Edmund, back. Uh, I was just going to say that I think the slice window and associated signage are fine. And, and Madam Chair, this is three, um, I guess, three separate case numbers. So, um, you know, you could case number 23-012 is for the approval of additional signage um, or the revision to the approved signage. So you could, you know, move forward with a motion to proceed on that. Um, then item 23-058 is the installation of the slice shop window. So you could also move forward with that one if the commission's comfortable. And then if the applicant is supportive, we could table case number 23-059, which is for the patio construction. I would agree personally with that approach. Um, if other commission members agree, uh, then I would ask one to put forward a motion. This is Bob Strickland. I'll put forth a motion to approve the um, slice shop window, uh, case number 23058 as presented with the sign. So we're going to uh, say slice uh, window, installation of the slice window on at this. We'll stay there without the signage, but we'll address that one next. Mr. Edmund, I saw your hand up. Do you? I'll second that. Excellent. Thank you. So we have a second on the installation of the slice window. Any further discussion? It's just a point of clarification. Is it uh, approval with it painted black as, as it is currently? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Edmund, do you yes. support that? Yes. Okay. Um, any further discussion? All right. Mr. Musson, please call roll. All right, Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Benezzi? Yes. Mr. Dreyer? Yes. Mr. Edmund? Yes. Mr. Strickland? Yes. Mr. Trasic? Yes. And Ms. Trot? Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes unanimously. Excellent. Thank you. Um, would someone like to put forward a uh, motion related to the signage revisions? I'll move to approve the signage revision uh, case number 23012. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Any further discussion? Not seeing any. Mr. Musson, please call roll. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Benezzi? Yes. Mr. Dreyer? Yes. Mr. Edmund? Yes. Mr. Strickland? Yes. Mr. Trasic? Yes. And Ms. Trout? Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes unanimously. All right, excellent. Um, we'll then move on to uh, asking if a commission member would like to put forward a motion related to tabling the patio addition. Mr. Dreyer? I'll make the motion. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? This is I'll second. second. We have a second. Mr. Musson, did you catch you made that second? I have it as uh, Mr. Edmund. Yes. All right. Any further discussion related to the patio? All right. Mr. Musson, please call roll. All right. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Benezzi? Yes. Mr. Dreyer? Yes. Mr. Edmund? Yes. Mr. Strickland? Yes. Mr. Trasic? Yes. And Ms. Trout? Yes. All right, Madam Chair, the motion to table passes unanimously. All right, thank you. Ms. Ruff, thank you very much. could you talk to ownership, talk to staff um, to work through the details related to the fencing and so forth, and then we look forward to seeing you back here in the near future. Okay, thank you very much. Do you know when the next meeting will be? It's in three weeks, as Mr. Boston corrected me. Um, since July 13th. July 13th. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you. 
We'll move on to our next applicant on located at 9827 Lorraine Avenue storefront renovation. Welcome, um, if you don't mind announcing yourself and then telling us about your company. Yes, hi, good morning. My name is Kenny Hernandez. Um, I'm with Building Communities Investment Group and I am one of the owners. Welcome and tell us about your project and your proposal. Okay, um, uh, unfortunately I did not attend the last Zoom meeting. It was my partner that, uh, that uh, attended the last Zoom meeting. Uh, it seemed like there was an agreement with the storefronts um, of painting of the storefronts um, a black, uh, the removal of the signs we had discussed, uh, the removal of the old signs. There's two signs. Uh, yeah, the long sign there uh, and the one off to the side. Uh, of we 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 had discussed and uh, and agreed on uh, the removal of that. Uh, also, um, the awnings. Uh, there was a uh, discussion of uh, awnings, which uh, we were okay with as well. Um, I have Mark uh, also on the Zoom call. Um, he's the gentleman that would be assisting us uh, with the uh, uh and clarifying the window uh issues mark yeah I, I, uh, I, I don't know if you're are you on mark yeah i'm here uh okay. my name is mark muscle supreme window and uh the one of the uh, items uh that the committee before wanted us to take care of was the second floor windows uh, to remove the existing windows, remove the framing that was done to uh, uh, sh shorten the windows on the width and get back to the original state, original look of the building. Uh, there was some, there were some pictures provided from the 40s that I have right in front of me. Um, and that is what we are going to mimic. Um, getting back to the stick figure, um, as one member noted, um, more daylight of the glass, you know, just getting back to the original state, as well as matching the grid patterns, uh, three horizontal, three vertical uh, grids, um, and the, uh, and the exterior color would also uh, be that the black versus the white existing. So the idea is to get back to the original state. Um, and uh, one thing I just wanted to add just to be uh, on the up and up is the windows that are not faced towards the street, but kind of like on the return, uh, the return towards the building, you can't see it so well, but uh, there are smaller windows there. So I was assuming, I just want to kind of get this out in the open, that we would, again, um, since we can't really see it, I'm assuming that they also have grids on the top um, and that it would just match appropriately since it's a smaller window we would do um, instead of um, three horizontal and three vertical grids, but to do two horizontal and three uh, vertical uh, per sash, top and bottom. So, um, and one other thing as well, uh, which was mentioned is that uh, the committee seemed to be okay with uh, the grid pattern to be internal grids. Uh, so versus like simulated divided light, uh, seemed that they were just happy about um, the color uh, to match. That was of high importance, that it would be that black versus the white, as well as, again, the sizing to go back to the original wider windows. So that's, that's what I have. Madam Chair, you're muted. You. Um, before we move on, are you also proposing 
adjustments to the storefront? But I missed that in your presentation. No, um, as of the last Zoom uh, meeting with the city, uh, they were perfectly fine with the storefront. Um, what they were recommending is that uh, we would paint the storefronts. The storefronts, uh, uh, paint the storefronts black, um, and we're prepared to do that if uh, if we could finalize that for today. Uh, that's something that we were prepared to do. And the bulk had the small wall below the windows. Yeah, they had. Um, it, Mar it, Mark, if you can help me with that as well. Uh, please, can you repeat that? I couldn't hear. And what's your proposal for this? Uh, the bulk had the small wall below the storefront windows. Are you adjusting uh, that? Yes. Yeah, um, the board wanted a uh, like a shaker style um, wood paneling uh, to be applied to the bottom. So in order to match other storefronts that were provided as well, like a, a recess panel um using like an azac material um and that was just a suggestion by the board versus like uh being just so that it would you know just makes more sense practically to use an azac versus you know like a wood you know painting wood or something like this uh, due to the weather um so that that's what that was suggested and was accepted by us and we are willing to do what the city wants Excellent. And then are you also proposing canopies or awnings? I'm sorry. Uh, they, uh, that was discussed um, in the previous meeting and we're, we're more than willing to uh, comply with that as well. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you for that full explanation. We appreciate it. Uh, and the presentation we will move on to design review committee recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. This uh, project was seen uh, by the Historic West Clinton Design Review Committee twice. Uh, they did, at their last meeting on June 7, approve the conditions. Uh, the conditions were for the second floor windows to be black with 9 over 1 grid pattern and the proportions returned to the original size. Uh, the recessed panel at the base to be completed with a tile or composite material, um, as they've noted. To work with staff to finalize the base detail, trim, and accent colors to stay within the historic palette and to remove the existing signage and return for any future signage approval. All right, thank you. And landmark staff for review. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, staff is in agreement with the design review committee recommendations. Excellent, thank you. Then we'll open up the floor for the commission for questions and comments. I guess I'll start us off uh, and then welcome others. I appreciate the applicants uh, working with the staff and the commi uh, committee and taking their comments to heart and appreciate you going back to the original window size in the color black. Uh, so the wider windows in the color black, restoring the ones on the side. Although typically we do not support internal muttons, we like them to be extra supply um, installed. Uh, in this case, I think with the other work, um, I would be fine with that. Uh, and for the side windows, I think I would work with staff for the vertical um, configuration, but I uh, would support the three um, uh, configuration, the horizontal. I just lost the, the um, accurate name to describe what I'm trying to say, but it supports on um, that and work with staff to determine what's the right um, size, because we don't want, you know, six on um, in grid patterns on the for the muttons on the sides when it they're just proportionally wrong. So I would just ask to work with staff on that. But appreciate you considering and taking to heart the configuration or the modifications to the storefronts, the um, the bulkhead, and the installation of awnings. That's my um, pleasure. Mr. Strickland. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a clarification with regard to the muttons <clears throat> in the grids, uh, especially on the front windows. Uh, I don't have a problem with the interior muttons as long as they're not uh, just tape applied. It should be a dimensional mutton on the interior of that uh, pane. Also, 
with regard to creating the recess panels at the bulkhead, uh, AZAC cannot be painted black if it's exposed to any sun whatsoever. And I learned that the, uh, the hard way. Uh, AZAC literature says that they, uh, they will not warrant any installation with a uh, dark color paint applied to their material. So I would suggest that you investigate alternate materials. There's other materials other than wood that uh, you can paint black without distorting the material. Interesting, Mr. Strickland, would it take um, the colors that are used on the upper you know, box space? Would that would it take those colors or is it any dark color? Any dark color um, will end up absorbing heat and it uh, deforms the AZAC material. That's interesting. Yeah, it's right in their literature. I found out after I had to install reinstall panels. Got it. Great information. Thank you. Feedback from other commission members. All right, not seeing any other feedback. Um, would someone like to make a motion? It's a quiet group today. Mr. Strickland. Okay, I'll move to approve uh, the project as presented uh, with the modifications based on staff and design committee review uh, with the stipulation that the internal muttons be a uh, dimensional mutton, not just tape, and that an alternate material be used to create the uh, recess panels at the bulkhead. Right. Thank you for that motion. Do we have a second? This is Alan, I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Dreyer. Any further discussion? Um, this is Mark Moskow, Supreme Window again. Um, I just, just to clarify, um, the grids, uh, what, what do you mean by, let's say, the dimensional versus tape? Does that mean, because uh, at least with the factories I use, they say more like in regards to internal grid, they'll say like a flat grid versus a contoured grid. Is that what you're, you're referring to or do you yeah, mean? Exactly, a contoured grid as opposed to a flat okay. grid. Okay, 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 perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, if, Perfect, if I if I if I may, um, uh, I just want clarity on the base of the storefront. Is there any color in particular that you're looking for for the base of the storefront? I, I assumed everything would be painted black. Okay. Okay. And staff is happy to work with the applicant on finalizing the the color details and that sort of thing. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mustin for that comment also. Uh, so please reach out to staff to finalize the colors there. Any further discussion? All right, Mr. Mustin, please call roll and announce the results. All right, Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Benezzi? Yes. Mr. Dreyer? Yes. Mr. Edmund? Yes. Councilmember Gray? Um I was a little late, but I'm going to follow uh, and uh, agree with the, uh, with the board. Yes. All right, Mr. Strickland. Yes. Uh, Mr. Trasic. Yes. And Ms. Trapp. Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes unanimously. All right. Thank you. We look forward to seeing your project move forward. Thank you. We'll now move on to our next applicant, the Magnolia House, located at 10831 Magnolia Drive, renovations and addition. Hi, this is Steve Jennings, the LDA architect. And this is a restoration of an existing um, office space within a uh, what used to be an old mansion on Magnolia Drive. Um, as well as an addition at the rear of the property um, and also a renovation to the carriage house and site improvement. You can see in this, the right bottom corner there's, there's a uh, historic photo. I mean, it's still very similar to what it, it currently looks like today. 
Next slide. Now this is just a location map showing uh, the location kind of across the street from the uh, Western Reserve Historical Society. Next slide. Oh, and then here's just that same context map with some of the elevations of the adjacent uh, buildings. Um, number one is the uh, building directly to the west of our site, um, which was also a converted mansion into a um, school use. Number two is to the east side of the property, similar uh, non-for-profit type of use. Um, and then three and four are the uh, Western Reserve Historical Society across the street. Next slide. Um, here are photos of the existing conditions. Um, the four larger photos, we have the top left of those is the south elevation facing Magnolia Drive. Come in on the east side um, into the parking area, which is the top right image. And at the bottom left is the rear elevation, which has, you can see there's a handicapped uh, ramp that has been previously installed. And the west elevation is on the bottom right, and that faces the Hawkins School uh, building at on the property. On the left side, the three smaller photos are the existing carriage house photos. You can see the you know, garage doors were previously removed um, and, and filled to make that office space as well. Next slide. Um, these are just more of the context photos. Next slide. This is the proposed site plan. Um, the one main move we are making on the site plan is the existing driveway you can see is dashed in um, directly adjacent to the building. Um, so we're gonna move that away from the building. So it, there's a new curb cut um, the east. Um, and then that will be um, connected to this new parking area. We're providing significant amount of landscape screening um, for the parking. Um, from the parking to the building, um, we will be making the main entrance as part of the addition. Um, and we're providing a new accessible ramp up to that main floor level, uh, which will be flushed with the mansion's uh, first floor level. Um, so you can see the footprint of the addition is smaller than the mansion footprint and is directly behind it. Um, so from a, a direct street view, you would not be able to see the addition um, behind the existing building. Next slide. Um, I'll let Emily is our landscape designer and she can walk through some of the landscape. Sure, so on the site uh, existing, there's a um, garden in the front and that will be relocated and also turned into a native garden. Um, and then closer to the building, the historic building, um, in the historic photo, there was a hedge along the front. Um, we are paying homage to that, bringing that back and using a hedge uh, to screen the parking lot as well. Um, with the addition, it's kind of a mix of a modern and classical um, landscape form, um, color year round. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see we are planting um, a number of trees on site um, and uh, screening along the Hawkins side and the street and replacing street trees that have to be taken down as well. This is the site lighting. Um, a, uh, along the ramp, there will be lighting uh, to the building and then a uh, kind of mix of modern and classical uh, pole lighting and bollard lights as well. Next slide. So these are the floor plans. Um, so the first floor of the existing building will be primarily used for conference space. Um, and then the addition will be uh, more office 
use. Um, the carriage house is being converted into a community event space. Um, so that will be something uh, you know, that could be used more for the public than the rest of the um, house in addition. And uh, you can see here the entrance um, facing the parking area. Next slide. And then the second floor is all office use, um, so private offices and open office space. Next slide. So this is the view from Magnolia um, at the new curb cut. Um, so again, kind of showing the parking screening and how we're uh, moving that drive off the, you know, so it's not directly adjacent to the building. And you can see that, you know, the existing building is the primary focus um, from that street view. Next slide. Now this is a view as you come into the parking lot, um, focus more on the addition and the carriage house. So all the carriage house um, openings are being replaced with um, new windows to be you know, more uh, historical than what was there currently. Next slide. The windows in the existing house are all original on the first two floors. Um, so those will all be restored wood windows. The um, dormer windows were previously replaced, so those will be replaced with new aluminum clad uh, wood windows to match the historic style. You'll see that the addition we've kind of brought off the uh, mansion so that there's um, what we call a hyphen between the two. Um, and that will really be um, a primarily glass structure in between the two. We've stepped back the second floor so that um, you know it kind of cuts away from the, the roof of the existing building as well. The brick of the addition um, will closely match the brick of the existing house. And then the canopy color will kind of tie into the existing stone base color of the mansion as well. And that kind of ties through the around the other sides of the addition as well. And here you can also see the kind of stairs up to the entrance, and then kind of within the landscape is that ramp uh, as well. And then there's also patio space directly in front of the carriage house. Next slide. This is the elevation facing the Hawken property, so on the west side of the property, and bringing in that same kind of stone color as accents on this elevation as well. Next slide. And this is the view to the rear of the property, um, kind of the back side of the, the addition, a little bit of the carriage house on the left. Next slide. Um, this is the materials that we're proposing. Um, the mansion does have um, very old uh, asphalt shingles currently. Um, so we were proposing to replace those with a new um, darker brown colored uh, shingle. Um, at the bottom, you can see the various colors of the um, storefront is the bottom left one um, next to that. The blue green color is the shutters on the existing house. The brick is obviously the, the brick to match the existing. Now, um, kind of at the base of the addition in that um, ramp area, we are proposing an architectural cast stone, again, to match the color of the existing stone. And then on the upper parts is a aluminum composite material um, that have that same complementary color. And then the aluminum clad windows um, that would be in the dormer of the mansion and then the carriage house um, would be in that almond color um, as shown on the bottom right. Next slide. And then these are just the 2D elevations. Same thing that we just went through. I think there's just maybe 
one more slide with the carriage house. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we'll move on to design review committee's recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. This project was reviewed by the Magnolia Wake Park East Boulevard Grant Allotments Design Review Committee on June 15th. They did not have a quorum, uh, but the members present did state a uh, general approval of the design and the changes that are made to the site from the concept plan. Um, they also noted, um, well, in the concept that's still relevant is uh, concerns with the losing the landscaping along Magnolia. Thank you, and landmark staff review. And thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this project went to the PetBot Committee on May 9th, 2023. Uh, there were con some concerns about uh, fire truck access and turnaround that were raised. Um, they recommended a study for uh, safety access, you know, parking line overhead wire locations, et cetera. Um, recommendation to engage with UCI for bus stop relocation um, and reminder that tree permit for any tree removal or planting within the right way. Um, staff feels that the addition is appropriate within the historic context of the uh, of the neighborhood. The, the addition distinguishes itself from the historic building well. Um, we also feel, I guess, agree with the local committee that some additional landscaping in the front could help to make the project feel or, or fall more closely into the historic residential feel context of the historic district. But um, I think it's a, a very nice project and recommend mm -hmm. approval. Thank you for that recommendation and uh, those comments. We'll open up the floor to the commission. Uh, Mr. Edmund, would you like to start us off? Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to start by saying thank you to the design team for uh, listening to our comments last time and obviously being very thoughtful about going back and, and really looking at the design and, and think, um, you know, a lot, I can see a lot of work between that last time and this time. And, and I think uh, much, very much to the better for this project. I think that uh, that openness of the, the new addition um, I think the composition is very sharp. I think it really works, but it's um, still it's deferential to the existing building. Um, it also differentiates itself, uh, as was noted. Um, I like the the two forms kind of intersecting uh, and the more open glazing gesture or the, uh, the existing building. I think that hyphen, particularly with the step back at the second level, really works. Um, the uh, but but what I particularly like here is the ramp terrace, the terrace landscaping, that whole composition of entry that you've created, and that turn as you go in. I think that that whole um, composition is um, is is really works. One of the challenges with these additions is you have the traditional entry of the existing building and you have to create an, a new attractive entry that draws people to it without uh, taking away from the existing composition. And I think you've done that quite successfully. Um, also a small thing, but I, I think the light fixtures are a really nice sort of gesture to, you know, they're, they're clearly modern, but a gesture to uh, traditional light fixtures. Um, a couple of things that these are really quite minor, but a couple of things you might uh, play with here are, I, I think the mullion color, um, you might try, it looks like on the hyphen, you've got a butt glazed with the black mullions. Might try black mullions around all around, or maybe even a lighter color. Also the coping color, just something to play with to just kind of punctuate the top of the building. Um, and uh, the, uh, it looks like if I understand it correctly, you're using a brick that sort of matches the color of the blend of the existing building, but it looks like yours is a little bit crisper, like maybe yours is wire cut where the um, original one is molded. Um, I, I also think that's appropriate if, if your brick is, you know, a um, complementary color, but is a cleaner texture, I think that's quite appropriate. Um, and I also agree with the comment about um, 
see see about some thoughtful landscaping on the front. I think part of that may include um, pruning uh, some of those two those two ornamental trees in front that I think are starting to obscure uh, the building a little bit. Um, I, they're nice trees, but but might need some pruning. Uh, so overall, I think this is a very uh, successful improvement to what we saw last time. I think it's very sharp and very appropriate, and, and I'm very pleased to see it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edmund. Mr. Bonazzi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Edmund took most of my comments, but I thought it appropriate to echo a lot of those considering him and I took the lead last time, um, pushing you guys forward with the design. And I think, as Mr. Edmund had noted, it's it's really gone far. And I'm happy to see where this project came out. I um, don't need to go any farther than that. Thank you for all your hard work. I know it's sometimes hard to hear uh, you know, to hear big changes and then to, to do it is another thing. So I just wanted to express my excitement for the building and it's, I think it's going to be wonderfully appropriate next to this beautiful historic house. So um, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Benazzi. Um, I echo what my fellow um, commission members have said. I support, I think it's a very beautiful proposal and I support uh, the project. And I did not see it before, so I, I've only seen the end result. So um, kudos to you know, where you got uh, based on comments that have been said. Any other other uh, feedback from the from the commission? Would someone like to put forward a motion? Mr. Bonazzi, I see your hand up. Or Mr. Admin. I'm very bad with my words today. So Mr. Edmund, you say it and I'll second it. <laughs> uh, I, I move that the um, project be approved as presented with the recommendation that the proposers consider um, some additional uh, landscaping in the front. Thank you for the motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bonazzi. Any further discussion? All right, Mr. Musson, please call roll. Hey, Ms. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Benezzi? Yes. Mr. Dreyer? Yes. Mr. Edmund? Yes. Councilmember Gray? Yes. And uh, Mr. Trasic? And Ms. Trot? Yes. All right, Madam Chair, the motion passes unanimously. Excellent. Good luck with your project. We look forward to seeing it move forward. Thank you all again. Uh, that concludes our certificates of appropriateness. We will move on to concept plan review. Um, first applicant is located, or I think only applicant is located at 4732 Lorraine Avenue, renovation and addition. Uh, good morning. This is Wesley Harper with Horton Harper Architects. Thanks for having me today. Um, here to present the uh, renovation and addition to 4732 Lorraine Avenue. Uh, next slide, please. So our site uh, is a, a cluster of three and a half parcels, uh, I'll call it right now. Um, uh, are located on the northern side of Lorraine between West 47th and West 48th Street. Um, one of the parcels uh, contains uh, an existing structure and parking lot, and then the adjacent vacant land was purchased by uh, Jim Makito uh, from OCI in the past few months. Um, Mr. Makito has done a handful of projects on Lorraine Avenue, including uh, Forest City Shuffleboard, the Amelia Townhomes, and uh, I believe he's been in front of or one of his projects uh, at the northwest corner of West, West 45th and Lorraine has also been in front of you. So uh, Mr. Makito has a lot of experience on the street and we've been working with him over the past couple of months to uh, develop a mixed use project here. So um, from a zoning perspective, uh, the information at the bottom left here um, is really just kind of uh, stating the existing uh, 
uh, zoning that we have. It's a local retail district with urban frontage overlay. Number two height district uh, for 60 feet at the property line, or excuse me, building, building line. Um, and then parking, um, since it's an addition, we have a lower threshold to meet the zoning requirements and we have no flooring area ratio maximum. Uh, the zoning in this, or on Lorraine, is also um, a bit in flux and some things might be changing that uh, could possibly eliminate any variances that we may have. Most of it's stemming from the fact that uh, if you look at our site boundary, we have kind of a, a, a L shape kind of coming off the back of it. That portion is a two family zone uh, parcel, uh, which would be utilized to get uh, vehicular ingress and egress uh, from the parking lot. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> So you can see our site here, we're looking to the Northeast. Um, in the foreground, we've labeled uh, Lorraine Avenue. Our site is highlighted in uh, turquoise. And you can see that an existing structure is uh, overlaid with that uh, turquoise, which is the existing 4732. Um, you can see that uh, once we get above uh, adjacent structures, there were likely be a, a commanding view of the skyline and Lake Erie. And those are uh, some things that we designed the project to take advantage of. Next. We have some existing, or excuse me, historical photos uh, of the surrounding con context. Uh, the first picture here is from 1965, and we have the 4732 structure uh, kind of center right here. Um, you can see the configuration of the storefront. Um, I can't speak to uh, its condition any earlier than this, uh, but this is uh, what we will uh, be using to, to kind of redesign uh, uh, the storefront for that existing building. Um, to the left, you can see uh, two additional structures of two stories. Um, the one at the far left has recently been renovated and the one in the middle uh, has a couple of new retail spaces, I believe, uh, on the first floor. Next. Here we have uh, an image from 1937 showing the uh, corner building at 47th and Lorraine. Um, these two structures have since been torn down. Um, uh, next, please. Uh, to make way for the what is now called the Seamus O building here at 47th and Lorraine. Uh, the structure, uh, obviously not of the same vintage as uh, a lot of the other structures on the street. Um, it has more of a horizontal orientation with its windows and its detailing. Um, so our site, which is between the Seamus O building and the 4732 building, we have to kind of manage these two uh, opposing uh, orientations. Next. Uh, here's just some, some historical context. This would be across the street from our site right now. Uh, this is the Metro Health Facility and then uh, Urban Community School. Um, but I just thought it was interesting to see uh, some of the old context here. Next. So here we have uh, images of the current conditions uh, at left. Um, we have, uh, you know, the, the existing structures to the west of the vacant parcel. Uh, and you can see Shane So a little further down the street. And then uh, in the photo at the right, you can see the Seamus O building uh, all the way to the right, vacant space um, that was purchased from OCI for development, uh, the parking lot, and then the existing 4732. Next. At left, you can see the western side of the Seamus O building. Um, its, uh, its wall is uh, seemingly right on the property line, uh, which makes these windows that exist technically illegal, uh, but they are something that uh, we're going to be uh, kind of pulling our building away from to allow some light. Uh, and air into their windows and then windows on uh, our new structure. Uh, and then at the right, you can see uh, just kind of a, a view pulled further back, uh, looking at the site. Next. Uh, here's a view looking 
uh, at the parcel on West 48th Street. So um, kind of the curb cut on the other side of the street that's a bit covered in debris, that would be uh, the vehicular access, obviously new, uh, newly constructed curb cut and driveway. Uh, this would be where uh, vehicles would come in and out from the parking lot. Uh, you can then see the backs of the existing buildings uh, to the right, uh, which are west of our project. Next. Uh, here's some other images. At left, we have the uh, uh, Urban Community School. Um, at the top right, you can see uh, the building at the corner of West 48th and Lorraine that, uh, since this picture was taken, uh, Seems like they're really close to completing that renovation. Uh, and then you can see at the bottom right the uh, adjacent structure to 4732. Next. So, uh, obviously, our context on Lorraine Avenue uh, is a very eclectic mix of uh, commercial buildings with uh, office and retail historically uh, above the first floor. Um, there's buildings large, small, brick. Uh, you know, bay windows, uh, incredible signage, um, you know, storefronts that invite pedestrians uh, to come into the buildings. And so these are all the sorts of details that we're looking to integrate uh, into our design for the new building. Um, uh, so we can go to the next slide. You know, a, a real mix of different colors of, of masonry and brick. Um, and storefront materials. So uh, this was a very rich uh, context from which to, to start our design process. Next. <clears throat> Again, uh, buildings of uh, a lot of different heights, materials, uh, 3D, uh, enga three-dimensional engagement with uh, the sidewalk. Uh, next, please. Uh, again, just uh, showing that very context up and down the brain. Next. And then here we have uh, images of uh, a little bit more granular detail uh, of the storefronts, how different materials and different colors of materials are engaging each other from building to building, um, sometimes even within a single building itself. Um, and again, these are the types of details that we're looking to integrate into the pedestrian experience uh, of our project. Next. So uh, here we have a 1 to 30 site plan. So you can see uh, we would be consolidating the two parcels that face Lorraine Avenue. Uh, there's then the uh, parcel that faces West 48th Street currently. And then you see a little triangular wedge kind of uh, dashed in there. Uh, that is actually a piece of property owned by one of the neighboring properties. Uh, and Mr. Bikito, the developer, uh, has a great relationship with those neighbors and is working to establish uh, either an easement uh, or purchasing that kind of leftover wedge of property uh, to have a much more uh, well-functioning uh, parking lot for 23 spaces. Um, Long Lorraine, we have the renovated uh, 4732 structure, uh, which would be possibly a restaurant on the first floor and then amenity space in the rear and second floor. Um, to the east of it, we're proposing uh, a new uh, one story and then a five story portion uh, of the building. Um, the total square footage of this new footprint would be 23,351 square feet, 23 total apartments and then uh, just under 2,300 square feet of new retail uh, right on Lorraine Avenue. Uh, you can also see our proposed setbacks from the Seamus O building. Uh, we have a four foot section. Uh, that portion would have no windows. Um, and then we have a five foot section uh, that is set back and would have windows. Um, and the, the four to five foot transition defines a uh, very uh, direct material change uh, in the building. Um, the buildings on either side of us uh, to the west 
got two story buildings. And then to the right, of course, we have Shane. So, which is kind of two and a half stories. It's first level uh, appears to be elevated by uh, probably four or five feet. So it makes that one a little bit taller. Uh, next. So we'll go through the floor plans here very quickly, but starting here in the basement, um, we have uh, the existing structure to the left uh, would be restaurant uh, or amenity space. Um, we then to the east have uh, retail storage, or it could be uh, merchandising space as well with a stairway that goes down. Um, in the back, we have a bike room, which would contain private parking. Uh, for bikes for uh, each unit of the building, tenant storage, utilities, uh, and stair and elevator access. Next. On the first floor, uh, we made a, a very concerted effort to line Lorraine with spaces that would be habitable by uh, tenants, uh, retailers, uh, and pedestrians. Uh, we didn't want to put, you know, an elevator along the street, a stairway, wanted to maximize the potential uh, pedestrian engagement with the street. So you can see here a uh, possible restaurant or retail in the amenities, or excuse me, in the existing structure. Uh, and then moving left to right, we have the main tenant lobby and it's vestibule facing Lorraine, mailroom, and then three retail spaces facing Lorraine. Uh, we worked to get these uh, spaces to be you know, relatively modest sizes to encourage uh, local businesses and entrepreneurs to, to open up their uh, facility here. Once, uh, sometimes these retail spaces can get a little large uh, and sit vacant for, for long periods of time until they find a, a tenant that can afford that rent and need that amount of space. So we think this is something that would encourage uh, immediate uh, usage. In the rear, we have three smaller kind of micro apartments, uh, each under 500 square feet, but they would each have their own uh, private little outdoor uh, patio and landscaping uh, between those units and the parking. Next. Uh, the levels above uh, in the existing structure would likely be an amenity space uh, for tenants. Um, and then, uh, again, moving left to right, we would have a tenant roof deck, uh, which would allow residents to, to have some public outdoor space, uh, that would overlook Lorraine and have, a potentially, a, a kind of a green, uh, component that overlooks, uh, Lorraine. Um, you can see from this floor that we're proposing Juliet balconies for two of the three units facing Lorraine. Uh, and then for two of the units, we have um, uh, bay windows uh, overhanging the sidewalk. Uh, in the back, we have two units, and each of those have outdoor balconies. Next. Third floor is uh, much the same in terms of the residential component, uh, but the tenant patio obviously drops off on that second floor. Next. On this floor, you can see that we're setting back the uh, fourth floor and the fifth floor above it um, so that the pedestrian uh, experience along Lorraine is really kind of limited to the three-story portion uh, of the building. Uh, you can also see that uh, that space would be taken up, of course, by balconies for each of the three units facing uh, Lorraine. And then you can see the profile of uh, an overhang uh, above those bay windows. Next. Um, here's the fifth floor. Uh, no outdoor balconies, but each does have a juke yet. Uh, next. And so here we have uh, the result of that plan and the result of uh, you know, studies of the proportions, materials, uh, and storefronts of Lorraine. Um, you know, we wanted to very clearly define uh, our relationship to the scale uh, in terms of uh, the horizontal scale uh, of our project. Um, so we broke it up essentially into four new components or five new components actually, where we have the existing building uh, to the left. We have the kind of one story uh, entry vestibule to the tenant lobby. Uh, and then we have a, we've extended that height 
uh, in a kind of sculptural way, but to uh, still fit in uh, color-wise with that existing structure to the left. And we think that that play of contemporary versus historic um, uh, is an interesting play and uh, interesting way to, to kind of approach uh, the transition from existing uh, to new. Uh, moving left to right from there, we have uh, a structure that essentially contains one retail space on the first floor and then the uh, southwestern two units uh, as you go up. Um, between that and this uh, black brick structure, we've really struck a, a very a definitive line uh, to, to kind of announce that these are in some ways two different design components. Um, switches to uh, a language that contains uh, bay windows that run vertically to the second and third floors, and that's capped by uh, an overhang that further protrudes uh, by four to six inches past the bays to kind of contain that, uh, that design language. Below each of the, the bay windows, uh, we have the entries into the storefronts or, or into the retail spaces there. And then uh, at the base of each uh, storefront opening there, which are set back a little further to allow some areas of planting. Uh, just because this, this part of learning is uh, uh, really lacking any sort of vegetation. So we wanted to take some opportunities to soften that uh, uh, those edges. Um, and with the new Moraine bikeway coming through here in the next couple of years, um, you know, we think that could uh, relate to some of the, the design elements that we have in there as well. Uh, these uh, facades or the windows in these facades are set back, uh, kind of uh, more than typical in some of the other residential projects that have come through. We really wanted to define uh, the proportions of the windows uh, and how those relate to some of the more historic context. Um, to the right of the black brick structure, we have basically kind of bookended uh, the three-story portion with uh, a more vertical feeling element of kind of a, a yellowish um, gold brick. Uh, and then next to that, at the base, we have what would be essentially uh, Know, kind of a, a privacy gate so uh, people can't walk down that alley unless they're supposed to be but we're looking at that as the potential to add a, a another little pixel of color um, to the project um, you know uh, Lorraine certainly has a very distinctive uh, character I, to me a variety of color and materials is, is uh, stands out the most uh, above these three-story portions, we have the fourth and fifth floors. Uh, you can see the balcony uh, that is sitting in front of it. Um, this is more of a buff kind of uh, beige brick. Um, we're not looking to, to place too much uh, uh, attention on this. Uh, and uh, in speaking with the local design review committee at OCI or uh, Ohio City, uh, you know, we had some different ideas of, of how we can uh, maybe obscure the fourth and fifth floors a little more. Um, so uh, as we go through this process, we're going to be looking at uh, some other versions of the height of the three story structures or portions. Um, and so I think that could be a talking point, perhaps when we come back uh, to this committee and, of course, Ohio City. Um, Next slide, please. So here's a view looking towards more towards the northeast. You can start to see the western side of the proposed structure. Um, that brick will uh, you know, intentionally go back and, and terminate uh, a very specific uh, location and then transition to an EFIS material, um, which uh, will appear very monolithic, which is, uh, in our opinion, appropriate. Uh, due to the fact of, uh, you know, the rear of these structures historically are, are very utilitarian uh, and very uh, monolithic in many ways. Um, Shame of soap structures, uh, side facades are painted in kind of a, an orangish red paint that make that feel uh, very monolithic in our, in our view. So um, 
Uh, you can also see there's a very uh, definitive line struck between, uh, in this case, the red brick of the, the Western three-story portion and that more beige brick uh, of the fourth and fifth floors. Yeah, next. And just another view kind of rotating around the building. Next. Here's a view looking towards the northwest. You start to see that yellowish uh, brick on the side there, along with the uh, kind of coral covered aluminum gate. Uh, and so to get windows on the portion of the fourth and fifth floors uh, that are only four foot setback from property line, we're pushing those windows into the facade an additional foot. Uh, so that's how we're able to get windows uh, in that portion of the facade to take advantage of the downtown views. Next. Uh, here's, uh, you know, slowly getting closer to the, the storefronts and the pedestrian views. Um, you can see the very uh, uh, the simple cuts that kind of define the transition from different color bricks uh, to one another. Kind of see how deep those uh, upper windows are that are not bay windows. Uh, the windows in the black portion that are kind of in the middle, you can see we have uh, Juliet balconies and uh, kind of a railing slash uh, grating that would uh, give fall protection to those units. Next. Here's a view looking towards the northeast again. Next. Uh, here's a view uh, as if you're walking down the rain uh, to the east. Um, you know, we really wanted to have as much 3D engagement uh, with the sidewalk uh, through overhangs at the storefront entries, the, the bay windows, the overhang that caps the bay windows, and eventually, you know, signage for the, the retail will be a prominent feature of this, this development. Next. And then here's the opposite view looking towards the west. Um, you can see that we have windows on the uh, walls that are perpendicular to the sidewalk uh, to really start to open up those, those storefronts. Um, we also have some screening uh, elements in the, the setback storefront that face Lorraine. Um, you know, with this being south facing, uh, we get a lot of uh, direct sun here and, and sun management, uh, you know, is a, a big deal for, for retail. So we're looking to build that into the architecture of the buildings. Next. Uh, here you have the, the view of the rear of the building. Again, uh, this would be a synthetic stucco ephus. Um, you know, the color uh, could be something that matches the existing building to the west of us. Uh, you can also get a view of the Shane So building to the east. Um, and then uh, just a, a, as a note, um, uh, the fourth floor balcony that you see here, you know, we brought that element up so that that unit can have a commanding view of the downtown skyline. So, you know, the views, the context, all of these things are uh, elements that we took into consideration uh, throughout the design process. And you can also see the three entries to the three apartment units uh, on the first floor here. Next. Uh, here is our material palette, four different types of brick. Um, the bay window cladding, we're proposing a concealed fastener metal panel, the rear uh, ephus, uh, sandstone sills and wall caps, um, the aluminum storefront that we're proposing, powder coated aluminum gate that would uh, be between Shane O and our building. Um, the main entry for the residential vestibule uh, metal panel that would match the paint, of the existing building, and then uh, black metal guardrails and possibly perforated metal sunscreens. Next. Uh, and, and just referring back to the palette, you know, of course, this being a conceptual review, and that's kind of where we are in the process. You know, we, of course, have more details on how those things are assembled uh, as we move along here. Uh, uh, this diagram that we have here is just kind of a simplified version of uh, kind of the color uh, 
of uh, this portion of moraine. Um, and we'd be basically filling in and creating a, a complete block here along the northern part of the street here. And here we have basically the color of each building or the dominant color of each building and their, their width along moraine. So uh, our building is both adding larger and smaller elements uh, to the context here. Uh, you can also start to get uh, a sense of the height uh, of the existing buildings relative to both the three-story portion, which would be most prominent uh, as a pedestrian on the northern side of Lorraine, and then the four and five-story uh, portion. Next. Uh, here is uh, a more technical front elevation of uh, the project. You have the existing building uh, at the bottom, or excuse me, to the left. Top of the parapet is roughly 28.5. Uh, our third floor <coughs> parapets are roughly, I think it says 35.10. Uh, and then the parapet of the Shamuso building is roughly 32 feet. Uh, our fourth and fifth floor uh, atop that uh, kind of tops out at 58 feet. Uh, we're set back six feet from the property line in that sense, uh, or for that portion of the building. And uh, we are under the 60 foot restriction. Next. Uh, here are just the other uh, elevations, very simply uh, noted and drawn. Um, you can get a sense of kind of the percentage of brick that would be along the sides uh, relative to the EFIS. Next. <clears throat> Here's the eastern facade. Again, the, the area that uh, says brick type three, that face is set back four feet from Seamus O. And then uh, we're getting windows in that facade at, to, through pushing the, the four windows atop there, one foot back relative to that uh, facade. Next. Uh, and then here's the rear elevation. I think that might be it. Yeah. So uh, we've been to uh, Ohio City's uh, design review board. They had. Uh, Really, their biggest comment was uh, looking at some ways to play around with that third and fourth floor in terms of heights. Um, I'd say the general feedback was um, positive. Um, and uh, we were at the uh, kind of the local block club uh, level presentation on Tuesday. I answered questions from, from the group. Uh, and again, the, the feedback was generally positive, as is the majority of the feedback on co-organized. Uh, so with that, uh, I open it up to any questions you may have. Excellent. Thank you for the presentation. We'll sure. begin with uh, feedback from the CDC. Nate Law. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Uh, this is Nate Law, Neighborhood Planning Manager at Ohio City Incorporated. Um, I believe Mr. Harper already uh, stated, but I will restate that um, OCI was the previous owner of this land. We acquired it in 2017 um, through the land bank. I believe there was a building on this site that burned down about 10 years before we owned it. Um, so we worked with the Cuyahoga County Land Bank to uh, remediate the land and uh, ownership was transferred to us in 2017. Uh, we sold to Mr. Makito uh, in 2023. Um, so, uh, as Mr. Harper also stated, uh, this was presented at the OCI community wide meeting uh, that we hosted at urban community school uh, just this past Tuesday. Um, the projects also have been posted to core uh, for a couple of weeks now, and we're uh, actively seeking out uh, feedback on the project from the community. Um, the main questions that were asked uh, Tuesday from my notes were uh, questions about how the. The rear of the building and the parking lot in the rear off of West 48th Street will uh, interact with the neighboring single family home. Um, and additional comments were asked if the developer would consider uh, some more uh, full balconies as opposed to Juliet style balconies. Um, I think that's been a consistent comment in most new developments throughout the neighborhood. Um, but generally, uh, the, the, the comments at this time relayed to us have been positive about the project. Uh, specifically the materiality and um, some of the design on it. So I appreciate your time and I'll leave it at that for now. Great, thank you. Well, then we'll move uh, on to design review committee recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
the Ohio City Design Review Committee looked at this project conceptually on June 15th, 2023. Um, generally very supportive of it. Um, as Wes mentioned, there was some discussion about scale and the height. Uh, the idea was thrown out there to kind of break it up, maybe have, you know, one portion of the uh, of the front elements or the, or the lower building elements be three stories, one before, and then, you know, set back a fifth and fourth story a little bit more, just kind of, you know, I, I think Wes understands that they, they wanted to see some sort of other, other ideas of how the massing could work. Um, there's also comments about the bay windows. Uh, generally, they they very very much like the Oriel bays on the uh, the darker building, um, but thought that maybe a different material or color would help make them feel more context contextual to the uh, to the district. Um, so kind of separating them a bit from the body of the building. Um, there's also the idea of, of flipping that little L element over the. Uh, Kind of that that bridges the new and the old buildings so that it ties in more with the new building instead of the old one um yeah generally generally very supportive of it um there was also the comment though about the ephus in the rear that it sounds like the community echoed um it's just it's a lot of ephus on the on the back of the uh proposal um so i think you know picking a different color other than white might help but uh, some way to break that up, I think, would be well received as well. I think that's all. All right. Thank you. And landmark staff review. Thank you, Madam Chair. This has been an interesting discussion that we've been having. Um, and we're in agreement with the Design Review Committee on material color options. Um, when we consider this, as a part of the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, we look new work will be differentiated from the old and will be compatible with historic materials, features, size, scale, and proportion, and massing to protect the property and the environment. When we look at this for code, it's, it's, it's a 250 foot on either side to this, and that we also look at the block face that it is representing and ruling out any monumental buildings that might be around. There is enough contributing fabric on this block face to help inform the design. Um, if there hadn't been, you would look across the street and then slowly work your way out to, to look back. So take, taking a lot of that into consideration, um, the height allowed by the Cleveland Zoning Code is also overridden by the form-based code of the Secretary of the Interior Standards. The three-story portions have appropriate materials and massing, and the separation of the two buildings is appropriate and helps breaks out the streetscape. Uh, the bay windows and the cornice are appropriate. We had some concerns with the recessed windows. I um, think should play with shadow lines and add decorative elements. Facade is a little too unified. Um, the first floor needs an element to show some differentiation between the storefront level to the residential ones. And a cornice element should be introduced on the west side, perhaps maybe some portal in. Um, we also understand that financial feasibility is a consideration for these projects, and we understand. But Based upon the immediate context, five stories at this location is not appropriate. Four stories could be if it's pushed back enough. Um, and maybe some additional playing around with decorative elements or other considerations. Otherwise, it is great to see infill. Uh, the house that burned down, I believe, was a two-story building as well. So that was within the context. And it is mostly been vacant but there was maybe some uh, barns or other utility buildings on the site as well but nothing that would have really contributed to the historic district as a whole uh there is split zoning as mentioned so that is part of the issue um we do not have the full zoning review back yet and this is scheduled for an upcoming pet market Thank you. All right. 
Thank you for that uh, feedback. Then we'll open up the floor to the commission for questions and comments. Mr. Edmond, you'd like to start us off. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Carl, if we could go to the page labeled image two. Um, so first of all, I always appreciate um, the historic research and context uh, that, that you brought to this. And I think as a general statement, this is a, uh, a, a perfect example of being able to be uh, very modern, but also timeless. And I think contextually quite appropriate um, in your facade. Um, I, uh, I like, uh, I'll, I'll confess, I like your work generally, but, um, you know, I like what you've done to tie it in. Um, but, uh, also, like I said, keep it, um, keep it modern. Um, so most of my comments are going to be pretty minor things. Um, I, I do think that, um, in, in terms of, uh, so there's obviously some open massing questions. I don't have a problem with the general massing, although I think that the, Two buildings being exactly the same height creates a um, sort of an unpleasant tension there. So, you know, perhaps the west building could, you know, maybe the parapet is higher and becomes the the guardrail there or something. Um, but I think I don't know that a cornice is the answer there. But I think you know, looking some somewhat at what happens there between those two buildings would be could be helpful. Um, one question: the existing building. The Italianate building that you're renovating, is that already painted? No. Well, uh, yes, it's painted uh, kind of a light red. Okay. I, I was just going to say, if it wasn't already painted, I would recommend maybe not painting it. But yeah, um, the um, I also agree it's a lot of ephus on the back and perhaps some differentiation of the first floor might be helpful, although I would be very careful about adding any ornamentation to this. It, it just, it's just, um, you know, you, you, it, it, I don't want to go against the the the, the uh, motif that you're developing here. The uh, and be, because of the sort of minimal, you have a lot of minimal detailing. You have you know the very clean detailing around the windows and so forth. And I know you, you know you're playing a, a a pretty high level game here, and and that's going to take. Uh, real care, both aesthetically and technically, to pull off. I know these are kind of details you use a lot, so um, you're probably you know familiar with how to how to pull that off. But um, those those take a lot of care, and I think the 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 you know the surface quality of the materials, the bricks, and how they're treated, that's going to be so important to the um, aesthetic success of this. Whether it's the texture of the brick, even the jointing of the mortar joints. So I think a lot of care in that material is important. Now, the, the material colors that we see here in these renderings is quite different from what I saw in the material sample sheet slide. And all of the brick materials look, and the metal panel look much darker on the material sample slide than they look in these renderings. And I would just say that I think that the color palette we see in the renderings looks quite appropriate and I think works very well. But if you get as dark as some of the materials, particularly the black brick and metal panel um, that you have in the sample board, I, I think that would look, particularly the black would look pretty oppressive and, and would be problematic. But if it's more like what we see it here in this rendering, I think that that really works. Um, and I'm, I'm also sort of reading the renderings as if the, um, the dark brick has made, it's maybe a high iron content clay that has a bit of a sheen to it, which I, if I'm understanding that correctly, I think would be an, a really nice, nice surface there. Um, yeah, all of that detailing is going to be really important to this. I think this is, um, uh, this could really could be a project that we point to of how contemporary design can be really successful in a historic context. Um, but uh, we, we'll look forward to, to seeing this again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Admin. Mr. Bonazzi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there's a particular sensitivity to understanding context here, which really was evident in the presentation and the thoughtfulness of how you really analyze the site up and down the street, seeing the way materials interact and not so much ornament, but understanding the like 
affect of material. And I think that plays through both just in your general work, but particularly here in this instance of this project. And I think it's really successful. Um, I, I, there's a great sense of care in every proportion and every thing has been scrutinized with such, I, you know, um, it shows. I think in, it might be antithetical to actually what a lot of other people's comments have said, but in many ways the bay windows almost feel foreign to this kind of stripped, beautiful kind of rigid system you have going. Um, I don't know what the answer is there. Um, my other comment was particularly that having this kind of beautiful contemporary, almost deconstructed entryway next to the white building. I don't, and I love this little pop of coral that you have over here in the corner. I don't know if you would want to consider kind of bringing a really rich, vibrant color to kind of differentiate the sequencing between the brick structure, almost something very, um, you know, it feels, I don't want to say foreign in the bad way, but it feels foreign in the way of like, this is the entry because it's very different than this extremely historical thing to my left, well, this image left, and to my right, which is this kind of like beautiful brick structure. Um, I think that could also help to accentuate that as a point of entry um, and really make that moment feel really special when you're walking the building. Um, as for the height and the massing, you know, all the classic moves to kind of differentiate massing, the step backs, very successful. Um, I'm excited to see where you take it, given everyone's comments. Um, but I think it's extremely thoughtful. And Mr. Edmund said much more than I do, and he always beats me to the uh, raise hand. <laughs> um, but I echo a lot of it, and I and I think this will be especially one of those projects that if it comes out the way that I, it's looking so far, it'll be quite impressive. So um, I'm excited to see where it goes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benazzi. Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm really happy to see the brick. Uh, I think that's uh, nice to uh, continue that. Um, and I really like the bay windows and the uh, cornice above. Um, I would prefer that the uh, lighter, more ochre colored brick just be extended as opposed to the black and the black bay windows. Um, I don't think black is an appropriate color for the district. I think we see too much black throughout the city. So I think it, uh, 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 continuing that lighter color would be good. Um, I, as for the existing original building that's on the site, um, I, I realize it's already painted. I, think painting it white uh, is a little too stark. And the uh, cornice, uh, the, de the uh, details disappear with the black paint. I, so I, and I think those details should be celebrated. So something lighter there would be more appropriate. Uh, I, con I concur with staff on most of their, uh, their recommendations. Uh, my, my large concern here is the massing. I think the six feet setback for the five story uh, section of the building is not adequate. And I question even having the five stories in that particular block. It's uh, not something that, that's seen in that section of Lorraine. Um, my last comment is regarding that gate, gated area between the Seamus building and the new construction, um, being that it's a uh, large, that it's an opaque surface that could present a security problem because I, you know, I think it'd be better to be able to see from, from the inside, from the outside, what's going on there, especially if for some reason that, that gets used. Um, I probably have other comments, but I, I will, I will keep it to this for now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. I think my fellow commission members have added a lot. Um, the only things that I, I guess I would add is I echo much of it um, related to the staff and the fifth floor. Um, I think you've put a lot of care and sensitivity to the Lorraine Avenue. I truly appreciate your um, understanding of proportion. 
and using the proportion of elevation to window area um, and that balance in what you've put forward, I think it, it allows the, uh, the more modern to blend well with him uh, more historical. But related to the fifth floor, uh, I personally feel it is too close to Learning Avenue that um, it needs to either be stepped back uh, or reconfigured so that it's less uh, visible from you know, Lorraine itself. Um, I would also echo the comments on the rear and sides. I feel like you put you know, a tremendous amount of thought here, um, but the other sides feel a little bit more afterthought because of the color um, and the lack of detailing. Um, and that's really what's going to be facing the neighborhood. So I'd encourage you to look at the color material or and or just ways to um, break down the elevation as thoughtfully as you have done here on Lorraine Avenue. Um, related to the bays, I, I do like the bay windows, but I wonder if a more rectilinear shape would be more appropriate for the style versus the more angular traditional because you've done so much modern um, you know, detailing. Uh, for the rest of the building, and I think that was it. Those are my comments. Um, are there any other commission members uh, that have questions or comments? Not seen any, uh, and this is being a conceptual review. Does the applicant feel like you've received enough feedback from the commission to continue your design? Yeah, I have. I just want to go over a couple things just to assure you uh, next steps. Um, our intention, as I mentioned, is to start to look at uh, ways of pushing back the fourth and fifth floors um, and also obscuring them. Uh, I think there's a couple different ways we can do that. Uh, one of the committee members at Ohio City mentioned even bringing up the three story portions to be four stories. Um, that would obviously make the, the portion that's on Lorraine taller, but would almost assuredly obscure that fifth floor from view from a lot of perspectives. So that uh, in combination with uh, what I think was mentioned for bringing up the, the, the red brick portion only to four stories, we can maybe see how that geometrically starts to, to look. So I, I think, uh, you know, I'm gonna propose those uh, additional options to Ohio City. Um, I'll certainly have my opinion on which one we prefer to go with, but um, I, I think that investigation uh, will create some additional talking points. Um, uh, getting some brick on the back at the first floor, um, kind of creating uh, essentially a, a masonry foundation to that rear portion um, is something we're going to look at as well. Um, you know, brick is obviously a more durable material at, at ground level than EFIS, so that's definitely something we're going to look at. Uh, I'd hesitate to start getting too cute on the back. You know, I, I think um, some of the other projects that I think have gotten some negative feedback from neighborhood and your committee, you know, sometimes it gets a little too busy, but I, I do think there's some some ways to, to maybe sensitively add some 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 things to, to manage that. Um, definitely easy to look at um, maybe differentiating the color of the main entry portion. Um, you know, in, in some ways, keeping them the same color, I, I feel like makes the existing building feel larger and I'm, I'm starting to kind of step away from that perspective as we get more into it. Um, uh, but we'll be looking at that as well. Um, you know, looking at, uh, having a different color brick instead of the black, definitely look at that as well. Um, and yeah, the, the, the material for that door to the alley, uh, you know, as the details kind of work themselves out, I, I think it would definitely become more open and not kind of a security issue as uh, Ms. Anderson mentioned. Um, and, and I think with some of the things we're playing with, with the fourth floor can 
allow us to add square footage possibly on that floor, but take it away on the fifth floor and push it back. So I, I think there's some places to go there as well. Um, and uh, other than that, I, I think that's it. Uh, thank you for your comments. And yes, I, I do have uh, enough to, to go on for the next step. Excellent. Oh, wonderful. I think Mr. Musson may have one additional comment before we conclude reviewing your case. Go ahead, Mr. Musson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to say, Wes, it sounds like you're you're certainly on the right track, and um, you're, you're hearing all the feedback. Just as you play with the uh, with the massings and and you know where the fourth, fifth stories land and all that, I would just recommend when you come back to the Ohio City Design Review Committee, if you could have some some sort of sightline studies done, like not just from across the street, but a little further down the street, because I think when you get up to that fifth floor, especially, it's going to be visible from you know, a couple blocks down on the rain as you approach it. So I think just helping helping the committee and the commission understand, you know, visually where we'll see a fourth or fifth floor would be helpful moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. no problem. Um, I would also say, uh, you know, one of the bigger pieces of feedback we got from uh, Ohio City Block Club uh, meeting was, you know, there's been another project that uh, is happening further down uh, on Lorraine that is taking up essentially the entire footprint of the site. Um, and I think the feedback we got from both Block Club and Ohio City's uh, formal design review, the fact that we're not taking up so much of the site, you know, that has made them maybe a little more comfortable with the fifth floor than they normally would be. Um, so, uh, you know, we're kind of again playing that balancing act of uh, height and lot coverage and, and having enough parking and, and all of that. Uh, so uh, I guess that would be just something I've been keeping in mind uh, when thinking about the height and its appropriateness. Um, I, I think it's a design problem, not necessarily a, a massing problem. So I think with this next round of revisions, uh, we'll see where it takes us. Excellent. Well, thank you for the presentation. We look forward to seeing you uh, return back with your final solution. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that uh, concludes our conceptual reviews. Um, we'll move on to design review committee appointments. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Last week I emailed out uh, everyone the resume of Diane Willman. Um, she's a historic preservation consultant. She's been involved in a lot of uh, just National Register nominations uh, for districts, individual buildings, and, um, and preservation-related projects over the years. Uh, staff feels she'd be a great addition to the Little Italy Design Review Committee. So um, she's unable to be with us today, but um, yeah, everyone, everyone should have a resume. Hopefully, they had a chance to look at it. Well, I personally support this nomination. I think she's a, a great candidate. I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Brenges, were you going to say something? I just wanted to add a little bit more in context. We're also starting to reach out more to our preservation professionals throughout Cleveland and looking to add more to our other design review committees. They may not necessarily live in the actual district, but their experience with Secretary of the Interior Standards and appropriateness would, I think, be a great addition to each one of our committees in general. Um, Ms. Wellman lives nearby in Cleveland Heights, so she is fairly close by, so she is a neighbor. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I echo. I think this is a great addition. The more we can incorporate and embed them in all levels, um, the better, you know, reviews that we uh, do get prior to coming to us. So I think um, it's a wonderful candidate, and I fully support the appointment. Any other questions or comments from the commission? Would someone like to make a motion? I move that we approve Ms. Wellman's um, uh, elevation to the uh, Little Italy Design Review Committee. All right, so a motion to approve the appointment. Do we have a second? This is Alan. All right, do we have a second? 
Uh, any further discussion? All right, Mr. Musson, please call the roll and announce the results. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Benezzi? Yes. Mr. Dreyer? Yes. Mr. Edmund? Oh, step away. Council Member Gray? Yes. Mr. Trott? Yes. And Ms. Trott? Yes. And Chair, the motion passes unanimously. Right. Excellent. We'll move on to meeting minute approvals. So we have four meeting minutes that have been circulated. Is there any questions or comments on the meeting minutes? Okay. Would someone like to make a motion? Mr. Modanzi, go ahead. I realized I wasn't muted and I was like, I'll do it. And then I actually was making a joke in my head about 2018, but I don't think anyone wants to wants to hear uh, a joke. But um, I move that we approve the meeting minutes from January 11th, 2018, February 22nd, 2018, November 8th, 2018, and May 25th of 2023. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Mr. Trosic? I'll second. Right. Any uh, thank you for the second. Any further discussion? Mr. Musson, please call roll. All right, Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mr. Benezzi? Yes. Mr. Dreyer? Yes. Councilmember Gray? Yes. Mr. Trasic? Yes. And Ms. Trot? Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes unanimously. Excellent. We'll move on to administrative reports. Um, yes, Madam Chair, yesterday we had a site visit for an upcoming uh, proposal, so just wanted to thank all the members who made it out for that. Uh, reminder that we are hybrid, so any members who are able to join us are encouraged to do so. Um, and also a reminder that June is a five Thursday month, so our next meeting will be in three weeks on July 13th, 2023. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Side note, I just uh, want to say I like the new presentation style. It's uh, very legible. So thank you for the upgrade. It's uh, very nice. So kudos. Kudos to Jessica on that. <laughs> Jessica, good job, Jessica. Looks nice. Thank you. Uh, for a second, just to make sure I wasn't missing new information there at the beginning, but I, I think it's great. So thank you for taking the time to do that. It's very mm -hmm. fresh. Yes, very fresh. So with that, um, we will adjourn our meeting and look forward to seeing everybody in a few weeks. Have a great day. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Great Independence Day. Oh, yeah. yeah. Happy Independence Day. Yes. yes.